It's 12 o'clock, and this is the call to order of the uh, Human Services Committee. Uh, this is September 11, 2017, and the committee that's here, I'll be looking for approval of the agenda. Okay, comments, questions regarding the agenda? If I hear none, all those in favor, so I'm saying aye. aye. Not same signal? Thank you very much. Okay, we're down to public comment. We have a lot of public here. Come on, somebody. Anybody? <laughs> hey, at least somebody's laughing. Okay, we'll move on from public comment. We'll go to committee items. There'll be 4A minutes. That's for August 4th, 2017. Be looking for a motion support on that. Support. Okay, Rodney, motion, support. We got the doc, okay? Got it. All right. Any uh, changes, comments, questions, anything you need regarding the minutes? If I hear none, all those in favor, signal saying aye. Not same signal. Thank you. And now we'll move on. Give me one second here, please. Yeah, that's it. Human services. Okay, um, Shannon, uh, we're number B here, LifeWays Monthly Report. Hi, good afternoon. I'm here to go over some topics that were in the packet that was submitted to the to the commissioners. Um, first thing, we'd like to invite all of you, if you can, this weekend. Um, we're having our Stomp Out Suicide event here downtown. Um, on Saturday is the Stomp Out Suicide Walk, and on Sunday is the Battle of the Bands. So we'd love to have any of you come out if you're at all interested. Uh, next month, Mary Beth will be here with our CFO, Allison Magda, to present on the annual board our, I'm sorry, our annual budget and the annual audit that we just completed. Uh, the MDHHS block grant to move mental health screening upstream at a point of truancy referral is occurring. We have braided funding with the Jackson County ISD. So we are working with uh, the ISD and um, truancy to develop a process to do a mental health screening earlier in the truancy process to make sure that we're screening those juveniles who might need mental health treatment. We've received $1,100 in donation from the Jackson Eagles for our suicide prevention. We have a mental health conference planned for November 2nd. We are currently in the planning and design phase of a crisis respite center, a community living room, and the anticipated start date of that is January 1st of 2018. We are also working on a smoke-free campus at our West Ave um, location. Planning is occurring. Since October of last year, um, we've spoken with 9,974 Jackson County residents through our 211 system that identified about 9,662 needs, with 16.7% of them calling with a need where there was no resources to support in the county. Um, our next steps related to Section 298. Um, you said 16% no resource available in the county? Mm -hmm. What well, Do you have any sense of what those are? She didn't list them, but I can find them for no, you. No, I mean, I'm just curious. As Absolutely. 16% of something we don't have. Were these people calling for help? They call. They were calling our, our two one one for help. It could be from anything from utilities to housing to tax assistance to transportation to medical help. It's a referral point. Okay. Yep. So they can call two one one and they'll speak with a, a trained uh, two one one operator who has a database of agencies in the county that provide what supports they do provide and how you can access those supports. And so it, can, it runs a gamut. It can be, it's not just mental health. It can be any need that the person might have and is looking for assistance. I agree. I would be interested in finding out what we can offer. Okay. I will get that information Thank for you. you. And our next steps related to the Section 298, our Board of Directors, as part of our strategic planning process, we are evaluating strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats related to whether or not we would be able to be a pilot site with a Medicaid health plan in Jackson County. Any further questions for Shannon? No. Okay, again, she mentioned uh, uh, in regards to the uh, suicide events on Saturday and Sunday. Um, I'd certainly encourage anybody they want to get out there. Saturday, I believe, starts at 12 to 3 at Blackman Park. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a walk. Uh, and Shannon and I are going to 
race a 5K. Whoever oh, I wish. whoever loses has to pay five hundred dollars. I'm so. in Petoskey at soccer games. Oh morning. yeah, okay. All right, if I'll run there. If there's nothing further, I appreciate your time. No Thank problem. You. All right, bye. Thank you. Okay, we're on to number C, Health and Human Services Quarterly Report. Okay, I got an email that, uh, is everyone supposed to be here? I don't know. Did you know anything about that, Brad or Sandra? I don't know whether everyone is supposed to be here or not. Yeah, because I know Zoe can't be here, but we got an email from from Delane that Edwin's supposed to be here, but apparently he's not here. So we'll skip that for now. We'll go down to number D, uh, and that's the Medical Care Facility Quarterly Report. Sandra? Good afternoon, everyone. Census at JCMCF was below budget for the first four months of 2017. Additionally, <clears throat> our Medicaid rate had been reduced by $11 per day. Um, back in October 1st, which has been a real challenge for us. Um, and as a consequence, we're behind in our revenue where we would like to be this time of year. Um, May, June, July, and August census have been over budget. And um, <coughs> additionally, two other factors that have influenced our current state is <clears throat> we got a fine on a survey at the beginning of the year um, and we have had several open positions which we have been seeking to fill. Our nursing shortage has not improved anywhere in the country. And so now we finally are starting to feel it a little bit. All financials, bank statements, AP processing, AR, and other financial issues and, con and concerns have been reviewed. Uh, billing and collections are timely. And required Medicare oversight is in place and monitored. And we do that every other week. No issues have arisen in compliance. The 2016 audit draft is completed and submitted to the state, and the Lally Group has officially taken over uh, for Marianne Connor as our financial consultant at JCMCF. Um, we did have one question of the board, and um, our board was wondering if the resolution is on the agenda um, that they filed for October. Okay, that's been brought to our attention numerous times. Deborah, would you answer that, please? Delane does have it on. Um, she will have it on for the October agenda. The October agenda is not live yet, so the commissioners can't see it, but it will be on the October okay. agenda. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Under our people section, all resident care partner and visitor incident reports were reviewed continuously by myself. The core team, uh, which is a care partner group, uh, meet is continuing to meet, and the administrator, myself, continue with the fireside chat program that we have, which is monthly meetings to provide all of our um, care partners with news of what's happening at JCMCF. All our nursing administration positions are filled, and vacancies exist for both nursing and CNA positions. The revised staffing grid that I reported on before, um, we have completed that and had it run through our financial consultant to ensure we were on budget with it, and it is. Um, and so we have started to implement that, and that should reduce our overtime, provided we can find people to work. Uh, residents who are able continue to be involved in our interview and hire process uh, of new CNAs and nurses, and we really feel that this has been helpful to us because they are our direct consumer and their opinion matters. They know the rules, the HR rules, and they are only provided questions to ask that fit within that framework. Um, we did fill our new IT position just this last week, so we're excited to have him on board and hope that that will help with our IT needs. Under service, uh, we continue to use social media to publicly honor our employees for years of service. All of our newsletters, articles, and reports are distributed and submitted timely. JCMCF continues to offer free meeting space for community groups who request it. And uh, we continue participation in our regional emergency planning groups. That has been very beneficial to emergency planning in our home. Um, we will also be represented in two chapters of the upcoming Mayor Rothschild Foundation at University of Maryland's publication on person-directed caregiving, but not sure on the release date. Under quality, we continue to score better than state and national peers on several very important fronts, which include antipsychotic medications, 
uh, zero acquired pressure ulcers, excellent turnover rate, and very low hospital readmissions. Additionally, all newly added quality measures uh, for which we receive Medicare fee-for-service reimbursement show us as aligned or better than our area homes and state and federal. Um, we're working on another governor's award. This is an infection control um, subject that they want to have um, reviewed, and we, it is the management of C. diff. Um, we have only had one in-house acquired C. diff infection in eight years. So they wanted us part of that study, I guess. Um, we have five overall uh, stars with a CMS, or four, sorry, C, C, it's my wishful thinking, um, overall stars on our CMS rating, and we continue with five stars in quality. Um, our annual state survey was conducted and exited on 720. We had eight citations, which is the lowest that I know of, at least in my tenure, and I believe it's the lowest in our history. Unfortunately, two of them were G's, and they will probably be finding us for that because in the change of regulations, in that new regulatory change, they have to find for all G citations. Growth. Our renovation um, preliminary plans for the state building services and fire marshal input were submitted and approved with minor changes. Those minor changes were made and they were resubmitted today. Jason Covell carried them up to the um, state people up, up in Lansing. Um, and then we hope to have those final approvals very quickly. Uh, we're also working, um, starting this week, working on the final budget and all the components to the, um, to the renovation project. Um, plans are going to be, those final plans will be provided to Rick Sheely. He's, always, he's been aware of the process all the way along. And um, Jason also said that he would be happy to meet with any of the board or any group of the commissioners that may want to see where things are at on the project. Our end-of-life care doula program is launched with five active participants receiving services. Um, actually, as that was as of that writing, we're up to six now. Um, we currently have 30 trained doulas and 20 lead doulas who can lead that care team and uh, they've become legacy work with the aforementioned people. Uh, we're working toward accreditation that we were offered to be a beta site for the Meyer Rothschild program um, for person directed care giving homes in the country. Um, our elders participated, I don't know if you were over it or got a chance to stop in at Art 634 this weekend, but um, we had four projects that our elders did together with our care partners, and they were submitted and accepted into that art show. Um, they're really pretty cool. If you get a chance, stop by. I think they're going to be showing them for about another month. Uh, we begin um, tomorrow with the Jackson Rocks program. We're Painted rocks, I don't know if you heard about the craze that has hit the country, but painted rocks are hidden in parks, and people find them, and then they go on Facebook and talk about it. But our residents are going to be engaged in that program, and they're also going to be doing two pieces of art with that project. Any questions for me? Yes. Um, number one, what is a, a G citation? Um, it means that it's a harm or potential for harm. It's the second tier. There's four tiers of survey citations. It's the second tier. It happened to an individual. And both of our G citations were wrapped around the same person. Okay. Second, Who is fine, by the way. Second question is, what do you attribute your success in controlling C. diff? Um, I'm interested because everybody else doesn't have your success. I know. Um, we are avid hand washing I mean we provide each of our care partners with their own hand sanitizer um, we have trained and trained and trained we do we really train way more I think than the average nursing home on these sorts of things we have a very strong infection preventionist she is just incredible um, and she has made kind of a a fun game out of being able to answer the questions right, being observed doing things right. If you're the first person to her office with the right answer to something, she collects little prizes at the different places that she's been for training, brings them back and gives them to people. Um, I think that we just do a good, good job of hand washing. Well, congratulations. Thank because you. Because that's one of the lowest rates I've ever seen. I know it's amazing, isn't it? I'm very proud of it. Anything else?
excellent reporting. Thank, Thank you, you, Sandra. Thank you so much. Okay. Edwin? If, no, if everyone doesn't mind, we're going to jump back up to C, and Edwin's going to report uh, from uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Good right. afternoon, Commissioners. Right. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to report from the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, we continue our efforts in foster parent recruitment. Um, we've had a lot of faith-based interaction, reaching out to the churches to see how we can partner with them to um, improve our efforts, either in providing more foster parents or providing support to the foster parents who currently have so they can more effectively do what they have to do. Um, several events, uh, the JAMA, JAXPO, Kids Challenge, um, the Pride Festival, and then Life in Limbo, which is a simulation of foster parenting. And so if you have any audiences that you think are interested in that, that we can present to, please let us know. But we go out and do a little simulation that kind of shows what happens when a kid comes into foster care, what the process is like as a way to inform people about the process and also as a way to kind of recruit people to join us in those efforts. Um, of those efforts, we were able to generate at least 53 new families that are interested in providing foster parent services. Uh, we're not sure how that's all going to turn out, but we're excited for that number. Um, with regards to retention, um, there's been several meetings with foster parents kind of exploring what some of their problems are and how we can better support them. We're trying to do a better job of kind of promoting foster care by wearing t-shirts, um, sending mailings out to different people and being involved in different activities. We had a family fun fest event where we invite our foster and adoptive parents to come in and join us to celebrate what they do for us. Um, and we made a game of that by encouraging staff to create baskets to show their appreciation. So there's a competition among staff to see who'd come up with the most creative baskets. Um, and then we award those to foster parents during that event. So we had about 193 people show up for that at Gene Davis, and we really enjoyed the time that we spent with our families and showing appreciation to them. The Jackson County School Partnership continues to spearhead um, the Handle of Care project, and they've been selected to submit their presentation to the Statewide School Justice Partnership Summit at the end of September. So again, just drawing attention to some of the great collaborative work that we're doing here in Jackson. If you look on the very back page, um, you will see that the Department of Health and Human Services is very involved in the community. There's a list of various committees and meetings that we're engaged in as far as collaborating with others to provide better service here in Jackson County. On a statewide level, um, there is a new data collection system coming in called Sigma. So right now, that system is going to replace what we have, which is Maine, but it's going to allow us to provide time and budget expenses, um, payments to different contractors. Everything is going to be funneled through this one system. So we're all preparing for that. Some, of, some parts of it are already gone live and we're already utilizing that, but other parts of it will go live in October. Along with that is the integrated service delivery system, which is more of a universal system that allows workers to not just work on one specific caseload, but essentially what happens is then we have different pockets of workers assigned to different tasks daily. So someone could call in and have questions about their case or about, let's say, applying for Medicaid. So instead of a worker stopping what they're doing, you have specific workers that are assigned to answer questions each day. So that allows them to be more effective in doing their jobs. Uh, the child care fund is going according to plan. There are no complications with that at this point. Um, we met with the county personnel to talk about next year's budget and make sure that all our numbers are in line and we're on the same page with that. The state is actually moving forward. We're renovating the building we're in. Um, they've started on the ground level. So over the next three or four years, um, they'll be renovating each floor um, to allow us to have some updates in equipment and to better manage the flow of people in the building. Thank you. Thank you. Comments or questions? Nothing? My son says hello. All right, thank you. Right. Thank any, you. any takers, Life in Limbo, let me know. If you have an audience that you think can benefit from hearing that information, please let us know. All right, thanks for showing up. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. We'll go down to number E there, Matt, the uh, MSU Extension Semi-Annual Report. All right, good afternoon. Let me find the...
So I brought some of my colleagues along with me today to share uh, directly from themselves what they've been doing in, the, in Jackson. So that's always better to have them share directly with you than me. So I'll be bringing them up as, as needed. But just as a reminder of our programs on the first slide here, just that we've been around since 1914 and we deliver programs in these five main topic areas here in Jackson County of food, nutrition, and health, 4-H youth development, agriculture, uh, the consumer horticulture, which is lawn and garden, and natural resources. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Heather Borden and Angela Maniacci to talk a little bit about our health and nutrition programs. Well, thanks for having us today. Um, I just wanted to tell you a, a few of the programs we've got going on or are in the works right now. In fact, um, I've told you a little bit about some of them in past presentations, but this particular one that you're seeing right now, the Nutrition ed Education for Pregnant Moms, is a new one that we just got. Um, this one's in the works. So uh, we got approved to teach this curriculum about two months ago. And um, this is probably more information than you really need about what the curriculum is about. I'll just tell you in a nutshell. This one's um, for women who are in a pregnancy all the way through birth and a little bit after. And then we would transition them into a different program um, for health and nutrition, taking care of um, their family or themselves or youth. Um, so this one's kind of different than what we usually do because it focuses on uh, more than just nutrition. It focuses on discomforts of pregnancy and exercise and all those things that um, doctors might not tell pregnant women or really know how to counsel them about. So it's a really cool um, new new curriculum we're, in, um, we're expected to um, roll out here in Jackson as soon as we get some partnerships. We've reached out to um, the teen pregnancy centers, the local pregnancy centers, um, uh, here in Jackson, and um, we've had some conversations, so I expect this one to get rolling soon. Is it a left click, Matt? Yes. Okay, thanks. Eat Smart, Live Strong. Angela and I are both going to talk about this because we've got some different partnerships um, in the works right now. Uh, this is for um, people age 65 and older, and uh, this curriculum uh, focuses on health and uh, nutrition um, and physical activity. I've done this program, um, I'm currently in a program actually with the King Center right now. I serve about 20 um, seniors there. And Angela, do you want to talk about, Angela's in more of the senior programming, so. I've done this at uh, the Atsego Independent uh, Apartments downtown, um, and I'm going to be doing another one at the Elaine uh, next door to Atsego as well. It's it's great to get them moving, get them uh, discussing with each other. Um, so a lot, a lot of discussion comes out of this, and there's a lot of fun games, of course, for them to for them to play. But um, a lot of budgeting tips because a lot of them are on fixed incomes. So very important information for specifically for this um, target market of senior citizens on. Social Security income, um, who may have limited mobility, ability to get to the grocery store and whatnot. A lot of tips to to deal with that. Healthy eating adds up. It's a curriculum for cognitively impaired teens and adults. Um, I've taught this curriculum at a few different schools. Um, we worked with Columbia Central High School in their emotionally impaired classroom, and I've worked with Jackson uh, Career Center in their um, cognitively impaired um, groups, so I've been able to teach this um, to teens, as well as um, a version of this curriculum to adults at the Kit Young Center. So we're trying to reach out to this population um, who are looking for life skills but aren't necessarily um, maybe getting all of the things related to health and nutrition that they could um, in their schooling right now. So, Cooking Matters, um, we talked a little bit about this one because this is the one that um, we still need funding for in order to be able to do the um, program for adults um, and families. We are able to teach the teen program. Yes, Carl. I don't mean to stop you in the That's okay. midst of your conversation. What are you, find, what are you finding in terms of cognitive uh, impairment with teens? What are you finding? Um, like what kind of population am I working with? or No, what, what's, what's the actual cognitive impairment that you're finding in the teens? Um, it's really a full gamut of impairments. Um, we've got some Down syndrome. We've got um, autism spectrum. Um, we've got some emotional impairments that are kind of stuck into the cognitively impaired, if that's the only resource room they have in their um, particular school. Is that what you're kind of asking? What, what are the populations like? Exactly. That's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very tough. Very tough job. I, I love working with them, though, actually. Um, they have been probably the most receptive and sweet um, group of high school students I've ever worked with. And this is coming from teaching high school before I worked for MSU Extension. So uh, they've been great. 
really good. And the, we have a lot of resources with the teachers, too. They're very supportive of this type of programming. So, yeah, it has its challenges, but it's also, um, I'll say, very rewarding. So, thank you. Yes. Are there other programs in the county that deal with the same thing? Because I've always been concerned with duplication of services and medicine where a research facility is here doing the same thing that this one's over here, but they're not talking to each other and just duplicating, you know, the same, the same research and wasting money. Sure. Yeah, I think that, um, of course, with anything, there is probably some overlap. I haven't noticed any other, I get a lot of calls for the cognitively impaired and emotionally impaired programming. So I am kind of under the assumption that we might be the only resource they've got right now. Uh, I haven't talked to other people um, that say they're doing the same type of work, but um, I'm thinking some of the other programs that we do, it's possible that that's happening, um, but um, not in that particular population. Okay. So. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the other ones I wanted to talk about before I turn this over to Brittany, sorry. Um, we've got a new curriculum called Spartan Performance. It's um, sports nutrition. We've been able to uh, put together a program that offers this sports nutrition curriculum to all high school athletes. Um, uh, and so we're working on um, offering this to Jackson Public Schools. And, uh, and then we kind of put this program together with a um, nutrition education program that's for adults with um, school age kids um, to teach the parents the sports nutrition side of things um, so that they're learning more about how nutrition can influence performance and um, injuries and recovery. So we're excited about that one and um, we both have a lot of passion for um, working with athletes too, um, being athletes ourselves. Um, there was one other one. I think both of us have um, done a curriculum that's not shown in this um, PowerPoint called Healthy Foods, Healthy Families, and we've been able to work with um, families uh, in the Jackson County area that are more um, in the urban areas. Um, I worked with the a, a organization called Together We Can Make a Difference, um, and we did a program not too long ago, um, a six-week series of cooking for teens and adults. Uh, it was a mixed program, and that went really well, and you've done some of those programs mm -hmm. as well, yeah. Um, yeah, some of the um, programs I've been working on recently, um, recently I worked with the Young People of Purpose, the YPOP. Uh, if you haven't heard of them, their motto is uh, empowering youth to succeed through art, business, culture, and service. And this um, woman, Diane Washington, who runs this group, really empowers um, kids of all ages to learn as many skills as they can and then use those skills to then help serve others. So I've been working with them, teaching them a little bit about cooking and nutrition um, to, to help, hopefully help further their skills. Um, and then also working with farmers markets in the um, community. Currently I'm at the Green Market with Henry Ford uh, and I'm hoping to expand um, next uh, next farmers market season into a couple of the others, uh, like Grand River Market, and uh, get people familiar and uh, with the resources that are at the farmers market. Um, it provides recipes, uh, preserving fresh fruits and vegetables, just tips on how to take advantage of the local resources and really get to know the vendors as well. It, it helps them talk to them and, and really get to know them and become comfortable with the farmers markets. Did you have a question? Actually, the administrator does. Yeah, well, yeah I was just thinking, how many people do you reach? How large is the Elaine and Otsego, those those facilities I really don't know yeah that's a good question um, I had about 10 um, I, I I think I'd probably on average I'd say we have 10 in all of our programs would that be accurate to say it's well it does varies, depend because yeah. we'd go into schools as well so when we do the school programs obviously you're hitting 25 kids or so in a classroom um, multiplied by how many classes you're in but in the community um, right now with the farmers market I've got 10 uh, at Otsego I've got 10 I'm hoping to get more than that for combining the Otsego and Elaine um, and hopefully some other facilities downtown as word spreads um, they get they get larger so a lot of hopefully some word of mouth will help with the downtown uh, with the downtown partnerships um, and then with the farmers market um, I've got I've got 10 in the one I'm in now and I'm hoping to start another one in two weeks so they're gonna um, advertise that on their website shortly yeah, it kind of depends on the curriculum as well. Um, we're piloting a new teen curriculum, a teen cooking curriculum. Um, I'm going to be working with the Teen Hub for the first time um, starting this Wednesday. They've got 17 kids in that program signed up, which is really at a little above the threshold that um, 
I was hoping for, but you know, I'm not going to turn anyone away, obviously. So um, it, it is just variable. Um, we work with Hunt Elementary. Um, that is one of the nutrition education in school programs that I'm doing. Angela's got a few too. Um, and that's about 400 youth every fall. Um, and that one's a good one because they're in the above 90% free and reduced lunch. So they're in like the top, top tier in Jackson County for um, programming like this. So it, it kind of just depends. I don't know if that's going to be helpful. Um, Matt would have some overall numbers, I think. Yeah, I was curious as to Elaine. I don't know how many people live there, yeah. what you know, kind of penetration we're getting in there. And, yeah. and some of these partnerships are pretty new, too, because um, Angela and I, Angela hasn't been here quite a year, and I just had my year anniversary um, in August. So we're, we're kind of making inroads and in new partnerships. Which, which leads me to where, you know, how are, how are we trying to market the program and grow the program, obviously? Yeah, um, those are good questions. So I would say we have kind of a, a eight-fold <laughs> approach. Um, we flyer in the community, which is how I got in a partnership with the Teen Hub. Um, I've got, we've set up some um, online resources uh, like the, the Remind.com. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's like a texting um, uh, texting reminders type of um, applications so that people can sign up for texts and then get information about the programs we offer. Uh, we go to a lot of what we call one-time presentations and put our information out there and try and network with other um, organizations in the community just to form more partnerships, things like that. So There's like, a lot. I assume you work perhaps uh, with Department of Aging or... Yep. or Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So every time um, we go to like community meetings, like emergency needs, and connect with Faith -based them. Faith-based groups, yep. uh, churches, and yep. such. Yeah. We do a pantry at Trinity Wesleyan, and yeah, just just cold calling, all of those things. Yeah. Um, well, just you know, obviously, it's a great program. The more we can get folks involved, yes, the more good we can do. Yeah, and um, we're always open for more partnerships because. Um, Honestly, the easiest way to um, get into the community and serve the populations we're trying to reach is through partnerships. It's harder when we're trying to just put flyers out there in the laundromats and hope that people call. It's harder to get uh, concentration so that we can serve people. So partnerships are key for us, yeah. Any other questions? Chairman Shawa? You've kind of went into it pretty good here, but have you reached out to private organizations that have been formed in Jackson in the last couple of years, I think of Tome Pace, that has real impact going into all of these senior care facilities similar to the Elaine and Otsego because they have the people in Tome Pace literally on a weekly basis making sure they're getting all their services provided, they're getting some of these different educational needs met. I just, I'm thinking of the private sector also that there might be organizations out there that where you could get a deeper penetration with the seniors that are I don't want to say indigent but they're you know they're the only ones left in their family type situation there's no kids there's no relatives left in town or anything like that and I know that they've stepped up and have been meeting with these people explaining to them what their Medicaid benefits are what their health care benefits are how to eat right at home how to get in contact with different organizations and they're doing exercise programs with them and physical therapy coordination and, and that type of stuff. I just wondered if, if we reach out to the private sector also. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd have to look at our list. We both have running lists of people we've made contacts with and I know sometimes depending on when we hit them they might say come back in two months you know and we'll be here or our you know they might not have somebody on staff to organize um, somebody else coming in and doing presentations with them but absolutely I've gone I, I know I've gone and I know Heather often we're in and out of the office going to places with flyers trying to talk to them individually face to face um, I've been over to tell my pace I've been to we've been to you know Reed Manor and we we, we actively go into a lot of these places to try to to um, to try to connect with them you know on a face-to-face -face level um, and so yeah we do have if you have pe places to add to our running list absolutely we would love as many as we can to continue just go down the list and contact as anyone we can so yeah mm -hmm. I just connected with AARP a few weeks ago and did a program for them so we've got those type of partnerships in the works too but like I, we don't know everything in the community both being about a year in here so yes please suggestions are Always helpful. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Any other questions for us? Back? Yes. Have you done anything with the home health agencies 
home health agencies. You know what? That's kind of a, a place we haven't worked a lot with, so that might be a good place to start I mean, for. I send patients all home all the time, okay. visiting nurse and home therapists. So they have nobody to take care of them, and so on. They live alone, and so on. I mean, that's I look at that as a really ripe field for you, and it's direct. You know, from product to consumer, sure. okay, and so on. Um, our programs do require most of them five or more participants, um, just time-wise to really get the curriculum prepared, get all the food prepared that we need to do and, and whatnot that might involve. So a lot of, um, I don't know if this would consider necessarily one-on-one, -on -one, but a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, um, I guess I don't want to go as far as to say it, counseling or anything like that, that we don't do that necessarily. Um, but if there is a group, like if this, if they had a group of people that could meet before they were then sent uh, back to their homes for, for therapy, that would be, that would be something we could do. Or even working with the, like the organization of home care providers to at least counsel and not counsel, but like share the information with them mm -hmm. that they can then use in their work. That would be a great opportunity to at least get the information out there, even if we're not working with the actual patient necessarily. I all mean, the you, time. Could, you could uh, deal with Allegiance and Great Lakes sure. and things like that, okay, and so on. And then they could pass out your flyers and information. Yeah, okay. we, you're right. We do work with allegiance here and there, sending our program information out. Um, like the, the Today's Mom, the um, curriculum for pregnant women, they've been helping us uh, get that out. So I don't see why we couldn't send more of our program information and see where it could go through those partners. Yeah, that's a good idea. Nothing else? Okay, thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. I'm up. No, no, it's okay. Questions are good. Um, so my name is Brittany. Uh, I actually know quite a few of you. I am the 4-H program coordinator for Jackson County. Uh, I've seen many of you around fair or if you come to a fair board meeting, we get to, we get to talk. So that's a good time. Um, so 4-H is a youth development organization for boys and girls ages 5 to 19. Uh, we utilize volunteers to deliver a variety of activities to kids throughout the year in a variety of subjects we really we cover everything so uh, these are actually a few pictures from the fair this year I I really enjoyed this uh, the young lady in the picture with the adult she was not very like excited she didn't think she did very well and then when they gave presentations it turns out she did very well and she got a plaque and I just I love the look on her face because she's usually not that thrilled about things uh, and then we have the poultry showmanship. And for those of you who were around a few years ago, we weren't able to bring birds to the fair. So this year we were able to, and the kids were really excited. And, and that's a group of our showmen. So for the 2017 program year, uh, we served over 3,300 youth. And that includes 500 year-long members. These are members in clubs in the communities around Jackson that participate in usually at least a monthly meeting uh, in addition to their specific project meetings, whether it's photography or poultry or goats. Uh, so we had more than three quarters of those participating in the fair. Uh, if you came down, our barns were full. We had, we had a lot of animals and a lot of kids. We have 90 clover bud members, which is the most we have ever had. Our clover bud members are members that are ages five to eight. So they're the kids that aren't able to bring animals to fair, but they are able to participate in a variety of activities that we have. Uh, throughout the year, we've actually been trying to expand those. Uh, we have workshops that we put together for our Cloverbud members where they come and they'll do an activity and they bring them to fair. They also are working on kind of adding some value. Our clubs are getting, uh, they're getting Cloverbud leaders, so they're able to deliver programs to the younger generations and keep them engaged through their younger years. Uh, program growth and scholarships, we actually, once again this year, we were able to expand our scholarship opportunities and give out more scholarships to kids. Uh, exploration participation, that's our event where we hold it up on campus, where kids go up and stay in the dorms, they eat in the dorms, and they go to classes around campus. Uh, we actually had more kids going than we have in the past. Uh, we're lucky enough to have a foundation that supports this and provides scholarships to the kids to be able to, to attend this event. Uh, program expansion goals. I'm setting up some meetings with local school districts and school leaders and community leaders trying to 
reach the kids that 4-H hasn't traditionally reached. Uh, we're trying to get project clubs started within the city of Jackson because historically we've been kind of on the outskirts. So I'm developing some partnerships within the city to try and engage a, a variety of demographics. In fact, Sarah is working with me on that project. So hopefully we'll, we'll get some stuff for that. All right, um, are there questions about 4-H or? I have a question in regard to 4-H programming. Um, what do we do to, to uh, as a way of, I mean, there's the traditional 4-H programming, then there's non-traditional. Yeah. Can you give us some examples of more non-traditional? Because I'm looking to, to reach uh, a broader audience for 4-H and activities. Uh, in, you know, uh, inclusive of our community. Sure, yeah, and actually one of the things that I've been looking at is trying to develop a more, uh, have our programs be more reflective of the demographic diversity that we have in the county. Uh, studies have been showing that 4-H programming in non-traditional communities, so more than just the agricultural aspect, uh, studies show that the actual model, the year-long model, might not necessarily work for different populations, so we're working on what's called a spin club. It's a special interest, it's a short-term club geared towards one project area. Generally, there are still exhibits, so that would be your photography or your sewing or theater, but we're finding that groups are venturing into robotics or sailing or anything that might be, you know, just the things that you don't think of when you think of 4-H. So, Food and nutrition is another one. I know that we're working on, uh, Heather and I are working on a project to develop resources for a greenhouse project. A uh, school, an at-risk uh, at population that wants some greenhouse curriculum. So we're gathering that. Uh, it's really open-ended. It could be anything you want it to be. So, so then, uh, so anyone has an interest to be it from boat building to making a guitar, they could really create a 4-H program out of it or? We're very dependent on volunteers. Uh, so if <laughs> I would not be the one you'd want to uh, to teach someone how to make a guitar. But uh, we're very, I'd like to develop some partnerships with businesses. Uh, we're, for example, we've had a need for people wanting to know how to decorate cakes. Kids want to bring, you've seen the decorated cakes at fair. They're fantastic. Um, so we're working with a, a local business to hold a workshop series to get those kids the skills that they need. Um, if I know that there's a need, I will work to find a, a business or an individual that would be able to teach that. So. Thank you. Oh, that's okay. So I'm Phil Toko. Some of you know me from MSU Extension. I'm one of the extension educators oh, in... So, <laughs> I'm Phil Toko. I'm with uh, one fisherman, of the fishermen extraordinaire, from what I hear. Well, uh, just yeah. a, only when it comes to catfish. <clears throat> anyway, that that was all I caught was catfish. So, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, some things going going on in the ag community. One of the major issues that we have in extension when it comes to agriculture is really reaching out to people that are not involved with agriculture because it may seem intuitive, but um, is a, less than 1% of the entire population is involved in agriculture. And as we get further and further from the farm, the people that are legislating, the people that are actually making the rules that, that everyone has to follow, don't really have an understanding of how the rules that they make impact, agri impact agriculture. And a case in point, uh, there was some uh, legislation about outlawing certain, uh, certain, uh, uh, the, the, certain things with regards to, to water, for instance. I don't know, many of you may not have been familiar with the waters of the United States ruling that, that the feds put into place. And they really didn't understand how waters are different on agricultural lands. And in some cases, the rules made it so that ponds, vernal ponds or drainage areas that were wet in the springtime were actually considered waters of the U.S. because of the way that the, the legislation was set up. They just didn't have the experience and understanding when they made the rule to sort of get rid of sort of those caveats in the rule. So in educating our, in educating the public, we then educate those people that are, that help set up the rules. So 
one of the, the ways we do this is Jackson County Family Farm Fest, this idea of bringing folks out to the farm to get them to see sort of what happens behind the scenes. And this weekend is our next Jackson County Family Farm Fest. We usually get between 500 and 1,000 people at each of the sites. So they come out, they see the, the different sites, and they learn a little bit about farming. So it helps educate them and provide an opening, a door opening with regards to seeing how, how agriculture works. Um, Volunteers are always welcome. Just give us a, uh, at least a week's notice to say that you're interested in coming out. This year, we're featuring uh, Nellie's Let We're in Napoleon. Typically, what happens is we rotate around the, the county, and we're in Napoleon this year. We'll be moving probably to around uh, to the southern end of the county next year. But we'll be at Nellie's Lavender Estate, the YMCA store camps, and Curtis's Farm Market. So they'll be showing off what they do in each of those locations. I'm going to leave brochures here. I know you, you, want, you have issues with us approaching the bench giving you stuff. So I'm going to leave these here if anyone wants them after the meeting they can come up and, and well sometimes they like ask for like submitting them into the, and all that jazz. They just shoot it so this is easier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I understand. This is easier. So so and then another thing that we're work, that we work on to try and get folks to understand that food comes from the ground. Believe it or not a lot of our youth don't really have an understanding that food comes from the ground and not from a package, or the grocery store, or the, the drive-up window at McDonald's. Um, so, Chairman, yeah. I move that we receive a pair <laughs> Phil, Phil, while you're talking, I'll do this. Oh, part. great. I will great. approach this very <laughs> Like, okay. Here we go. All right. Uh, okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. So... The other, another major thing, or another push that we do within schools is we actually reach out to each of the, the schools to have master gardeners come in as part of a more coordinated effort. Uh, we've partnered with uh, we Can Make a Difference House, as well as um, as uh, the St. Vincent de Paul, to put on uh, something called Jackson County Big Seed. It started out as a way to get uh, low-income communities or low-income individuals who were interested in growing their own food, get them the, the, the things that they needed to grow their own food, whether it be seed, whether it be having a portable garden, which was basically a bucket with a tomato plant in it, so that if they were evicted or they had to move, they could take it with them. Initially, that's how it started but then in our outreach efforts we extended we started partnering with uh, the master gardeners to actually we picked a book and had those master gardeners go into classrooms around the county read the book that had something to do with whatever plant we picked for that year and then lead the children in a planting activity and then gave them an invitation at the end of that to come to the Big Seed Garden Party where they could bring back their, their plant in a, in a garden contest. So it really started building it. Initially, it was supposed to only be one little thing to help low-income folks get the seeds and the, and the plants that they needed to grow a garden and turned into so much more. Last year, we reached out to every elementary school in Jackson Public Schools, and we were in every elementary school in Jackson Public Schools. It was a pretty significant thing. Um, this takes place in March. The, the reading part takes place in March with the garden party happening in late May. Uh, youth readers are always welcome. We have master gardeners, but we're always happy to have people from the community serving as, as guest readers. Contact the MSUE uh, office in January if you guys are interested in doing that as well. So, And with that, we're on to, wait, am I going backwards? No, there we go. Okay, here we go. Any questions? Questions, comments? Oh, I <laughs> So I have a couple other just quick updates I wanted to share with you. Um, obviously, it's better to have them here telling you exactly what they do, but we have a few other things I wanted to highlight real quickly. So we have, as you may or may not be aware, there's a lot of stress in the farming community right now with the commodity prices, the, the downturn of agriculture. Um, so we actually have teams of educators that are working across the Agricultural Institute as well as the Health and Nutrition Institute. On the Health and Nutrition side, they're focusing on the stress, stress reduction management piece of that with our farm financial planners. So we have this communicating with farmers under stress workshop that we've been doing around the state. Um, and we have had participants from Jackson County participate in these sessions as they've been offered in different locations. Um, it's really helping them learn, those producers that are under stress, how to manage that, how to deal with that, and then helping them also with some of the financial decisions that they need to make moving forward. So it's been a really good example of the network of those not necessarily housed here in the Jackson office, but delivering extension programs from around the state. 
Um, we also have been doing some work in water uh, resource management. Monica Day is housed here in the Jackson office. She's been partnering with um, some of the rest of her water team from around the, around the state, uh, working on these different programs, so discovering potential um, to do good while doing well. So that's sort of a career pathways in water sustainable jobs. Again, tying that back to youth, giving opportunities for youth development at the same time as understanding uh, water resources. And then also looking at the Conservation Stewards Program. Um, this is a program that happens usually in the spring, um, and there's 40 hours of 40 hours of curriculum that's offered to participants in this program around um, natural resource, water protection, those sorts of things. Um, and that creates more volunteers in the community to go out and do things like stream cleanup, cleanup days, um, helping lake associations with some of their water resource management, those types of things. So it's been a really great resource for that. Um, and then also reducing agricultural nutrient loads is another program that uh, we've been doing in agriculture. We have a team who are partnering with MDARD, NRCS, other local partners on the Western Lake Erie Watershed Basin and the algal blooms in, in Lake Erie and trying to help uh, do that. So we've been doing some programs to help demonstrate runoff issues and things that may be um, linked to that. Um, one of the other programs that our state and local government team offered is regulating medical marijuana facilities, um, a, shop, a workshop for local governments. Um, and here I just want to kind of give you an idea of the 800 participants from around the state. We did have some from Jackson County participate in this program. Um, but it was a statewide effort with the changing regulations um, regarding medical marijuana and some of those issues. Um, in, in terms of Michigan State's um, rules and regulations, because of our federal funding and such, we cannot do any programming related to the production or cultivation of medical marijuana. Medical marijuana but we can talk about the issues as it relates to um, the rules and regulations of dispensing and all those kinds of things. So we have been partnering with our local units of government to help provide some education um, in those areas as this, as this issue is evolving over time. Um, here's just some quick statistics. We have been really making a diligent effort in our district and statewide to really use our website and, and um, social media and other things to really get the word out about extension programs. So this is just a snapshot of the last month of our District 12 website statistics. Uh, remember, this is a district, so this is the six counties. Um, this is from Google Analytics, so it's basically the servers that are being used to access our content. So it's not an exact science, but it gives you an idea um, that we've had nearly 50,000 um, residents or people using computers in District 12 to access MSU extension materials uh, in the last month. Um, we're getting about 3 million views or more um, a quarter on our website through MSU extension as a whole. So with that, um, appreciate the time. I know this is a little extended for our report, but I wanted to make sure you heard about all the good things that are happening here. And again, it's just a snapshot of the work that Extension's doing to support the residents of Jackson County. So any other questions? Other than that, thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna test for myself. Heather, Brittany, Angela, Phil, Matt. You did it. Cool. Nice job. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for reporting. Chairman, sure. could I? Do you have a card that I can have Certainly. to contact you? Yep. Thank you. Okay, we're on the number F here, and it's the Department of Aging. Receive a report. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about love, you know. All right, Marcy, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hey. Is next on the agenda the chore, snow removal, and lawn uh, mowing bids? Okay. Uh, we have, through Region 2 Area Agency on Aging, older Americans grant funds that pay for snow removal for older adults who um, don't have the either financial means or family resource to do snow removal for them. And then uh, depending on how rough the winter is, there could be funds available for lawn mowing uh, in the spring. So you have before you on the staff report uh, the recommendation of the lower bids with uh, Doherty Tree Service and J&J &J All Seasons for snow removal. And then for lawn mowing, it would be deer run for the grant year that starts October 1st, 2017. Might thank, there be any questions? Thank you, Marcy. Uh, we're looking for a motion and support. So we 
got the motion is Rodney, and we got the support is Dr. Tompkins. Questions or comments from Marcy in regards to this? This is something that happens on an annual basis. Yes. Uh, Marcy stays on top of this. It's part of her budget. So if, it, if there's no other questions, all those in favor, someone was saying aye. Aye. Not same signal. Thank you. Okay, Marcy, you're up again. Thank you. This is the time of year that people who have Medicare need to check their Part D, their drug uh, coverage, because the company that they've been using for Part D could change the drugs that they're going to cover. So we do welcome people to call and make an appointment to meet with a, one of our Medicare Medicaid Assistance Program volunteers or staff person to sit down in front of a computer and go to the Center for Medicare Medicaid Services and look at what plans are available depending on what drugs that senior is currently taking. But for people you know, we just, again, really encourage people to check that Part D plan. Um, people can go to the CMS or Center for Medicare Medicaid Services website themselves and, and figure out how to pull information for the drug plans for 2018. Uh, but people need to call for an appointment if they want to talk with someone in the Department on Aging because there is such a volume of people who are asking questions we need them to call to make an appointment. <coughs> Excuse me. Our annual volunteer recognition is Friday, October 20th and it'll be at the Human Services Building. So entertainment is at 11 o'clock with uh, lunch at noon. And this is also a time where we give uh, appreciation to a local service provider who's worked with the Department on Aging so that we can provide services for older adults. For example, uh, we've had the Jackson District Library in the past, uh, volunteer income tax assistance and disability connections and other agencies that we've shown our appreciation. And next, let's see. My icon is missing. Move your cursor up to the top, Marcy, and then it should drop there. Ah, thank you. Just minimize the agenda. All righty. Thanks. What I wanted to do in this presentation is It'll be a brief overview of Department on Aging Services and some other information, some sensitive information. And then I want to kind of focus down on how one of our home care services impacts uh, not only the quality of life for older adults in Jackson County, but also um, the cost of services when you compare different levels of service. So uh, how our programs through the county help in the overall cost of people being able to live in the community. So in general, our services are focused at the Department on Aging on prevention. We want people to eat well, like MSU Extension staff have said. We want people moving, people eating nutritiously, uh, being engaged in classes, exercise classes, music, volunteering, a, a variety of services that we have at our different senior sites. We have support services, including um, in-home counseling for homebound information and assistance, Medicare information, and then our home services, personal care, homemaker, respite, chore, and then our largest is Meals on Wheels. And we're, this is part of the healthy community component of the County Board of Commissioners' strategic priorities. And the uh, census data for 2010, 32,000 people aged 60 and older reside in Jackson County, 20% of the population. And compared to the previous uh, census, that's up 20.8% uh, from t the 10 years previous. And what's interesting to me is that in the 2010 census, 66% or two-thirds are in that category of age 60 to 74. So what that means to me is 10 years from now, um, people will be, might be more likely to need more in-home services. Although our, we do focus on keeping people, again, active and engaged and good nutrition for as long as possible because that can forestall having them, having them have a need for other services down the road. Our home services, as I mentioned, personal care, and I wanted to focus uh, uh, with our home services or even our senior site services. We don't charge a fee. We have suggested donations, and that's through the Older Americans Act uh, requirement. So I'm focusing today on Meals on Wheels. 
And the Meals on Wheels of Association of America recently uh, had a study done on how people receiving Meals on Wheels, by them participating in Meals on Wheels, it reduces the number of hospitalization visits they have, ER visits, and also is when you when they the study looked at Medicare costs and persons who receive Meals on Wheels, again the cost of ha utilizing hospitalization services go down when you're a Meals on Wheels participant. They did compare, though, Meals on Wheels participants with those who didn't receive Meals on Wheels and found that still Meals on Wheels participants, even though their utilization of medical care costs went down, they still were higher than people who weren't receiving Meals on Wheels. But I, So I wanted to point out that part of the, the study, but also point out the fact that they're receiving Meals on Wheels because they are homebound, they are more frail. So therefore, they are going to need more medical services. But again, by receiving Meals on Wheels, the incidence of going to the hospital are reduced. Did that make sense? Yes. OK. So, so by having local services, uh, we're helping reduce the incidence of people, older adults, needing uh, hospitalizations. Higher, so they have higher health care needs, but meals help them reduce the incidence of hospital care. And in that is also light house cleaning, so that we do the vacuuming, so that someone reduces the chance of trips and falls, which is a, that's a high incident rate of going to the emergency room as trips and falls. So light house cleaning service can help reduce that. So there are levels of care from a higher cost nursing facility. Uh, was mentioned program for all inclusive care of the elderly or PACE, and there's a Tomei PACE program on Springport Road. So that keeps people in the community, but provides more frequent services that they can benefit from. There's assisted living, uh, Medicaid waiver through the Area Agency on Aging. And then the Department on Aging Services, the cost for someone to receive home care services and Meals on Wheels compared to other uh, services appearing on the left. And then uh, not including meals, but looking at home care services such as respite and home health services, uh, which I just noted that the Meals on Wheels are not included in those services listed to the right. So. There is a need for all levels of services. We need long-term care facilities. Uh, PACE programs are a great option for people to receive more services and be able to live, go home uh, and live in there independently as long as possible. Assisted living is needed. Um, all of these levels of services are needed, but the nice thing about Jackson County older adult services through the Department on Aging is it can delay the time that someone might need a more costly service delay the, the chances of them needing more costly service. Marcy, Any hello. questions? Chairman Shawa. Marcy, I've had the, the pleasure to talk with a lot of your different uh, participants from beginning, from beginning to literally almost the end of their lives. And they've always really appreciated the relationship they've had with our Department on Aging at the county and your staff. Um, they feel comfortable enough to talk to them about problems mm -hmm. that they probably won't talk to family members about. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they've really enjoyed all, like I said, all the different aspects of it um, with it. And, and I've had experience now with, with a lot of the different facilities that are out there and the help that's available. And I really think for, for the dollars that we have, Jackson does a wonderful job taking care of our seniors. And I think your staff should really, really get kudos. You guys are unsung heroes to a lot of seniors out there, and, and are very appreciative. They are very appreciative of you guys. Well, thank you for relaying that. I'll let I'll let our staff know. Thank you. Back. Um. Two questions. One, if you look at your graph, I'm just wondering what you envision in the future if 20 percent of our population is in that age group and 
eight to nine years, you're looking at probably 40, 45 percent in that age group, okay? And you don't have that many young people coming in, okay? So you're going to end up with a community which is going to be many, many, uh, many people in that elderly age group, but not enough no volunteers, young people to, to do that. Have you thought about that at all? Yes. It is, it is a concern because the um, baby boomers have that name for a reason. It's going to grow quite a bit and then kind of drop off. And so the need for services is going to be there as well. And right now we're, we're pretty well stagnant um, with resources, I mean, doing, doing what we can. But yes, there would be a need for some kind of options, whether it be at the Department on Aging or other resources. For people, because we target people who aren't eligible for Medicaid, but yet they don't have a lot of savings or monthly income to pay for services privately. We're kind of in that middle group. And I do see the need for more services in the next five, eight years. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anything else? I, Marcy, uh, I appreciate you listening to me. Um, I also appreciate your comment about the uh, our aging population, which falls into that middle ground, which we've talked about. So mm -hmm. you're very much you're very much on target there. All right, let's move on. One to more one more thought: the classic car the classic Sorry. car festivals next week on Tuesday. I have some flyers by the sign in sheet, and that's a t that's an outreach event to the community, so we can let people know about services we have, and it's in partnership with the fair man the fair manager too. That's a good point. Yes. Next week. It, from t week from tomorrow. It, it's yes, and yes. Yep. Four thirty to seven thirty. Yeah, that's. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a wonderful event. Uh, I know the people who now run that. Uh, they've done several of them for us in Leone Township, and I know that you had the largest one last year of 298 vehicles, and I expect to even have more vehicles and a much bigger event. So you obviously do an excellent job of that. It's nice. Denise Owens take care, takes care of everything classic car related, and we do the food and the information. So, yeah. All right, thank you. All right, thanks. Richard. I bet you Richard can be lightning speed on these things. Good afternoon, all. I will try to do my best. Um, I think uh, our strategic plan, no, oh, a third contract, okay. The amendment to the contract with Henry Ford Legion's Health for Medical Director Services is really very simple and straightforward. It simply represents the need to change the name of the physician who is serving as our co-medical director now from Dr. Katayan to Dr. Faust. Nothing else has changed in this particular agreement with Henry Ford Legion's Health, so uh, it's really uh, just a administrative change, and I'd appreciate uh, some support for that as we move forward. Thank you. Excuse me, we have a motion of support. Any comments or questions? All right, all those in favor, signal saying aye. Aye. Not same signal, thank you. Okay, Richard, next. All right, well, uh, in the study session, we did uh, have a pretty good discussion and presentation on the draft 2018-2022 uh, strategic plan for the health department. It has been posted up on the health department website. We have shared a link to it through Facebook and other social media platforms. And it has been shared out with um, our Human Services Coordinating Alliance members and the, the uh, Health Improvement Organization Coordinating Council. I don't really expect any significant changes to take place uh, between now and, and the comment period that we built into the review process. So I'm hoping that uh, the board members are comfortable with this plan and we can approve it today to move it to the full board. Okay, thank you, Richard. I'd be looking for a motion of support to send the strategic strategic plan onto the full board. Okay, comments or questions? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor signal saying aye. Aye. Not same signal. Okay, monthly report, Richard. Thank you. Um, 
I indicated under administration that uh, we did uh, reopen our RFQ, if you will, for proposals for a learning management system. We just have four responses that are under review, and as soon as we complete that, we'll be looping back uh, to you for a potential agreement with the vendor that we've decided to, to, to go with. So that's kind of where that's at. We had a really successful Head Start Roundup at the Health Department on, on uh, August 15th. I wanted to report to you. This took place in the large conference room in the Human Services Building. We thought we'd have 50 families, and we certainly did. I think we had more than that come through. As you may be aware, Community Action Agency has three Head Start programs in the community at different elementary schools, and this was intended to help them get their Head Start children up to date on all the required tests and screenings, if you will, that need to take place because the program is federally funded. So it could be lead testing, it's hearing and vision screening, it's immunizations and those kinds of things. So it was a very successful event. I think we were uh, mildly surprised at the turnout, but I think Community Action Agency and the Health Department will probably do this every year now going forward. So it was a nice collaborative effort. Um, I wanted to share the 2017 program highlights, highlights of the reduced Reducing Underage Distracted Driving Program. I got some statistics in that particular paragraph, but also the attached summary report uh, was prepared by one of our health educators who coordinates the program. And I thought it was a, a few just interesting points from the survey result. 63% of teens reported being a passenger in the car where a driver was texting or emailing. That's very troubling. 76% uh, of students believe their classmates are likely to engage in texting and driving. 62% of classmates are likely to prevent a friend from texting and driving. I don't think that's working too well because 63% did it. So <laughs> overall, though, the, the students are very pleased with uh, this particular program, uh, and we should continue to do it because texting and, and, and emailing while trying to drive, I don't know how anybody can do it. I, don't, I can't do it, and I certainly don't want to learn how to do it. But I just thought I'd share that with you. Uh, <laughs> on the uh, uh, back side of my report uh, is a quick discussion about mercury disposal. Yes, elementary mercury is still found sometimes in our community. And we actually had a gentleman pass away uh, about a month and a half ago or so, and his wife actually found a small vial uh, about the size of a golf ball, if you will, the jar was, of elemental, elemental mercury. And we don't run this very often, but when we do, we, we try to help out uh, our community partners. Uh, she turned into the Blackman Leone Township Police Safe and Safety Department, and we were able to connect them up with uh, a disposal option through the Environmental Health Division in Ingham County. So we were able to accomplish that, and we're really glad that we could do that and keep it out of the environment. The 80s elbow pictus mosquito is kind of moving north, uh, as you can imagine with uh, warmer temperatures and longer kind of uh, summer seasons, we're beginning to see some movement of a mosquito that's capable of transmitting Zika virus. And that's what this is, whole thing is all about, is describing. Um, it's one of those mosquitoes that moves around and one of the, it's one of the ways it came to the U.S. in the 1980s was through tire imports. So we're, we're paying attention to that and MDART is on top of it as well. In the month of August, we also had some West Nile virus activity reported to us. Uh, both a horse and a deceased bird tested positive for the virus in Jackson County. And so we always do some press release and public education around these things when we find them taking place in the community. And um, just want to let you know that in the month of October, I'll be coming back to you to consider a small grant opportunity of $20,000. Uh, it's uh, about addressing tobacco dependency through dental clinics in the community and this would be a subcontractor relationship with the Michigan Primary Care Association. So that's expected November 1st start date. And I think that's everything I have for you. All right, Richard. Any comments or questions for Richard? No way? All right, again, thank you very much for everything. and Thank you. Have a good rest of the day. You too. Okay, we're on to 5A claims. I need a motion and support to the full board for the claims. Okay, all those in favor, someone say aye. Aye. Not, same signal. Okay, round to other minutes. Uh, that involved uh, DHHS, uh, if you want to review that at your own convenience. And we're on to number C now, which is the October reporting schedule. Animal Shelter, Community Action Agency, Region 2, AAA, LifeWage Department, and Aging and Health Department. 
And now we're on the public comment, which is 6A. Public comment. Okay, hearing none. Committee member comments. Any committee member comments? Okay, hearing none. It is 11.15, and we're adjourned at the call of the chair.